All right, so we are back. I hope everyone as well had a great break. Um, and thank you for your patience with me. I'm all plugged in now. So we should be fine for this uh, second presentation. Um, so the good news is there are fewer slides, right? And less things to read in this second half. And so I want to um, take a little bit of a different approach to the second part of this as well. When we got started at this day, um, we definitely went into some heavy theory in terms of microeconomics. Our firm um, problem um, in a, in a uh, micro-econ model of the economy. And then when we thought about the firm problem, we were also thinking about the firm as part of an equilibrium um, relationship. And that in competitive equilibrium, um, that's usually a starting point for looking at some of these welfare questions that we may be interested in. Um, so we looked at those first and second fundamental theorems of welfare economics, just to uh, refresh your memory or to fill you in on a basic statement of those, if you have not seen that research before. But we said that that was really a part of economics where it starts to become much more normative, right? We start actually thinking about imposing judgment calls into our economic analysis um, before we think about um, optimal public policy. And so what I wanna do in this second half is think about a case study. And um, this is a case study um, that is drawn by some material from others. So I do want to acknowledge that this is from teaching the ethical foundations of economics. Um, and it's from a particular application that looks at what we should do um, about sweatshops. What should we do about sweatshops? So um, you'll note that that is a normative statement, right? What should we do? Um, we're going to impose some value judgments and we're going to be thinking about posing ethics specifically. Um, again, to give credit where it's due, this particular um, work is um, something that's circulated through the National Council on Economic Education, or a version of this. And so it's been conducted in some other settings as well. Um, but I'm drawing from that material and then adding on to that material in terms of what we're doing here. So we're going to think about some complementary approaches for dealing with moral problems. Um, and we're also going to think about using these approaches to analyze ethical dilemmas. Um, for example, thinking about the context of sweatshops in some countries. So um, as an overview of this, um, there's an economic side and an ethics side to this. And so from the economics perspective, we often think about sweatshops and sometimes we portray sweatshops as being this kind of horrifying underbelly of a global textile and apparel industry. Um, and so we wanna think about what is a sweatshop um, and then distinguish between different types. And what I mean by different types of sweatshops here is I wanna think about one that's operating in a competitive labor market and one that's operating in a coercive labor market. So in the first hour, when we were doing our, our first part of our presentation um, today, we talked about competitive markets in general. We weren't necessarily restricting to competitive labor markets. We were thinking about competitive markets um, overall. And in the context of a competitive market, we have price taking. And so what I mean by price taking is that we have so many consumers and so many producers that they're all just such a small part of the market by themselves that they're not influencing price by themselves, right? It's really the interaction of all of them at the same time that's leading to us um, having um, the price, right? The equilibrium price that's coming out there. And to support this, we're thinking about a product that is something that's homogeneous. So something like a t-shirt that could be produced by one firm or another firm or a third firm or a fourth firm. It can be produced all over the place, 
right? Um, in a very similar way and can be brought to market in a very similar way. So we're thinking about a product that has that kind of nature that it can be produced by a lot of different production operations. And that's important because in competitive markets, we also usually think of their um, being free entry and free exit into the market. And so if there's some kind of profit that's to be had, we would expect um, new firms to start up and show up in the market because there's free entry and they can produce the t-shirt as well, right? Um, and uh, consumers, if they want to purchase the product at the going price, they can show up, right? Free entry. And if if consumers don't like the price, they can exit. And if the producers don't like whatever the profit's looking like, they can exit, right? That's the idea of a competitive market. And so we wanna distinguish between that, a competitive market, and we're gonna be thinking about that from the perspective of labor and the determination of, of prices in a competitive market. And then we wanna compare that to something where there's some kind of market power and we might have something that's a mo more more um, easily described as a coercive labor market. And so each of those are going to have some different economic and ethical implications um, in what we study here. So that's the economics perspective. The um, ethics perspective is we can analyze the sweatshops on a basis of ethical outcomes, on ethical duties, ethical character, um, or we can base things on virtues. And so one of the compelling ethical arguments against sweatshops is that in some cases they may deny workers the minimum basic treatment that all human beings should receive. And we say should receive because we're making a normative judgment call um, here um, when we're speaking of that. But we could think about making an ethical argument against the sweatshops based on the basic treatment of human beings, right? And so um, all of this is going to hopefully um, elucidate for you um, why this result is maybe not the fault of markets, but it might be more um, properly described as being related to inadequate systems of justice, as opposed to really being a problem of the markets themselves. But again, we're gonna distinguish between a couple of different market characteristics in order to um, think our way um, through this. So our objectives here are to identify um, the causes of sweatshops. Um, we're gonna distinguish two main types of sweatshop labor markets. We're gonna describe three different ethical approaches that people might use um, to analyze moral problems. And then we, we want to apply these ethical approaches to a uh, broader discussion of sweatshops and finally evaluate the three policy options for evaluate three policy options. There may be more than three, but we're gonna evaluate three specific policy options for um, dealing with sweatshops. So we have several objectives um, that are, are coming up here. And we're really thinking of this as a um, introduction to different ways to analyze moral problems um, and apply these approaches to an, a particular application, um, discuss the elements um, that make up a sweatshop. Um, and for the de definition here, think about the reasons for why these sweatshops might exist and then reinforce this knowledge within the context of labor markets and the structure of labor markets um, specifically. Um, and then we want to think about ethical implications for workers um, themselves, but also think about what implications are for consumers that are in a variety of countries, including consumers in wealthier countries um, and evaluate these policy um, options as well when we go through this. All right, so we're gonna start by thinking about some features um, of sweatshops that have um, been indi indicated in terms of what um, institutions might look like in some uh, different um, sets up. So consider a case where there are low wages and there are long work hours and there may be health or safety hazards. 
right? And so these health and safety ha hazards might include some of the things that we saw in the um, empirical application that I was applying to agricultural labor markets, right? We might see, for example, certain chemicals that are being used and there being hazards associated with it. We might see certain things that have to do with um, sanitation and people being in close confines with each other. Um, there could be other things in terms of particular accidents that can occur because of particular machinery. Um, and so there's all kinds of health and safety hazards um, that would be described within the workplace conditions. Um, there may be more arbitrary discipline by managers or owners. That might be a characteristic as well, that there's some kind of breakdown in terms of consistency of management um, and consistency of the leadership. Um, we might describe workplace conditions as including no or very limited job security, uh, maybe physical abuse, threats, and intimidation, so different types of mental abuse as well. And then workers that are absent having a voice um, in the governance of um, their position as well, so not having a voice. And then sometimes we'll see things that are happening in terms of different demographics, um, such as um, the use of child labor. That's actually something that I've studied myself in the context of um, US markets and agriculture. Um, there's um, still a use of child labor to some extent um, across the country in various farm settings. And so um, that's another feature that's seen sometimes in sweatshops. Um, as well. All right, so um, one note that's um, in parentheses on the bottom there is that we should think about these conditions as resulting in a sweatshop when they occur in a combination. So when we have all of these features working together um, and when they're taken to an extreme and they're lasting a long time. And, and I point that out because these individual conditions kind of one by one Right there, there could be all kinds of industries where um, you experience some long work hours at a particular busy time, right? That doesn't mean that we're talking about a sweatshop. It just means that a particular employer is maybe particularly busy during a, a, a season or is facing a, a deadline, right? And so some of these things may occur kind of one off in all kinds of different employment um, scenarios but it's really the conjunction of all of them um, together that's creating um, the institutional environment that we want to consider here when we're thinking about what um, is um, sweatshop. So some other contributing factors um, that could be related to the presence of sweatshops would be dense populations, so congestion, um, limited education, high unemployment, few job alternatives, um, extreme poverty, workers with low productivity, an absence of social safety nets, um, perhaps a corrupt, weak, or undemogra undemocratic uh, government, um, secrecy and lack of work place transparency, sometimes in places without a free press, for example, and no system of justice to protect basic um, rights and consumer ignorance about or neglect of the plight um, of sweatshop workers. So there's a lot of different um, features, right, that we might think in terms of the um, institutions um, here. Right, so we usually think of institutions um, in economics. We think about all kinds of institutions that are evolving in market economies that help individuals or groups to accomplish different types of goals. So sometimes when we talk about institutions, we think about banks or labor unions or corporations or legal systems or um, not-for-profit organizations, right? All kinds of different important institutions in communities um, but we could think of something like a sweatshop as really a different kind of institution um, where there's clearly defined and enforced property um, rights, right? There's something that's, that's being clearly defined here that's just very different 
um, from some of those things that are occurring in more positive space, um, but may still be occurring in something um, of a market economy. When we're thinking about labor markets, um, particularly, we might be thinking about how the characteristics um, of the labor market may affect the existence or the severity um, of the sweatshops. So we might think on both the intensive and the extensive margins. Um, the um, extensive about the existence or not of this type of institution and the intensive margin thinking about whether each of these characteristics that we just described that are happening in conjunction are happening to a severe extent, right? And how severe that extent might be, right? So in terms of, of um, our market economies, we mentioned competitive markets and we could see a labor market as being competitive, um, but we could also see some examples of less competitive labor markets as well. And in a less competitive labor market, our worker might be facing higher search costs. Excuse me. I'm waiting for some people to pass where I'm at. So less com uh, workers may face higher search costs, and it, there might be some kind of barrier to entry. So competitive firms cannot enter. And so that would be a violation of that idea of free entry and free exit that we were um, mentioned before. And then the third part um, about characteristics of the labor market is not just if we're thinking about competitive versus less competitive labor markets, but how justice and competition may exist within the institutional setting that may be related to the place, for example, the country um, and uh, the relationships across countries um, as well in this environment. So for our market structures, our competitive labor market, our characteristics are we have many buyers of labor and many sellers of labor. We have free entry and exit. We have voluntary exchange, right? Everybody who wants to come get the product can, and anyone who doesn't want it can decide not to go get it. And same thing for our sellers. And there's just good information on both the buyer side and on um, the seller side. And so an economic prediction that would occur within a competitive labor market is that firms would be faced to pay an equilibrium wage that's determined by supply and demand. So just like we could say in a product market that there's a demand for that product and there's a supply for that product and the intersection of demand and supply gives us our equilibrium quantity that's being traded and our equilibrium price that's being paid we could draw the same picture with a downward sloping demand curve and an upward sloping supply curve, but demand would be the demand for labor and supply would be the supply of labor. And so the demand for labor, when we're analyzing a labor market, we may be thinking about the firm as being the demander of labor. So there's something that's a little bit different from some of the other things that you may have studied in economics where the demand side is usually the consumer well, the demand side would be the firm if the demander is the buyer of labor and the supply side would be the worker if the worker was the seller um, of labor. But we would still have that intersection of demand and supply that determines the quantity traded, which here would be our number of people employed or the number of hours that they're working. So some unit of the labor and it would be happening at some price, some equilibrium wage rate. And so the firms, because they're price takers, they would be paying the equilibrium wage that's determined by supply and demand. The wage would reflect the worker's contribution. Um, and if workers feel exploited, they're able to find better jobs, right? So this is a little different from some of the features that we were just thinking about in terms of sweatshops and exploitation, because there could be some labor markets where the wage is just really low and the wage is really low because of supply and demand, right? And because of the workers' contributions, so that marginal product, um, and here marginal product of labor specifically, that we were defining um, earlier today in the first um, lecture, right?
Um, in that type of a market structure that's competitive, however, if our workers don't like the job and don't like what's occurring there, they're free to leave and look for a different job in the economy, right? So that's a feature of a competitive labor market. A less competitive labor market, in contrast, we might have one buyer of labor or collusion of several buyers who are acting as one. So we mentioned in the first hour that if we had market power, you might have something like a monopoly. Um, or um, if we have one or two um, firms in a market, we might say an oligopoly, right? Monopoly, oligopoly. Those are terms that are used a lot in economics to examine market structures. But um, recall that for labor markets, we're kind of switching up the buy side and the sell side. The buy side is the buyer of labor. It's the firm. And so when we think about it that way, um, when we think about market power, we might not be thinking about one um, seller. We might be thinking about one buyer of labor. And so instead of calling this a situation of monopoly, some researchers would call this monopsony instead, monopsony instead of monopoly. Or instead of oligopoly, they would say monopsony, monopsony. And so that's what we're seeing here with this first bullet point as a characteristic. One buyer of labor or collusion of several buyers who are acting as one. So a monopsony or an oligopsony. Um, but we have many sellers of labor. So we have um, many of these kind of would-be workers out there that are on the supply side, right? And so we have market power on one side of the market, but not the other. We would have entry of competing firms being blocked, right? Because of this one buyer of labor or collusion factor, high costs for workers who search for jobs, worse of exchange because other um, job options for workers are artificially blocked because we don't have free entry and free exit. We have something that there's some kind of barrier to entry in this market. And our information may be one-sided. It may be what we call asymmetric, one-sided information or one-sided bargaining power or some inequity in terms of the bargaining power between um, this buyer of labor, the firm that has market power right, um, and has bargaining power and the individual worker by themselves that maybe has much less bargaining power. So our economic prediction in this case is very different from the first case. Now we think about wages as being set um, below a competitive equilibrium. Firms might exploit workers because they pay the workers less than the value of their marginal contributions, right? So we would describe this as being a clear case of exploitation, whereas in the first case, right, it's less clear because the wages might just be the result of supply and demand factors and might be reflecting contributions and maybe those contributions are low in terms of what's happening in that particular labor market. So two very different institutional structures and very different nature of competition, right? Recall that competition among sellers um, would lower costs and lower prices and encourage producers to produce more of what consumers are willing and able to buy. Um, and competition amongst buyers increases prices and allocates goods and services to those people who are willing to willing and able to pay the most for them, right? And this less competitive labor market could be a breakdown of some of those aspects that we sometimes think of um, in terms of voluntary exchanges. Right. In both cases, the voluntary exchanges that do occur are only going to occur when the participating parties expect to gain from that transaction, right? from that voluntary exchange. And so this is true for trade amongst individuals. It's true for, for uh, trade with organizations within a nation or among individuals or organizations in different nations and different countries. Right. Those features are all things. Um, that we might be thinking about. And this point about um, the um, wages reflecting the worker's contribution, right? Income for a lot of people is determined by a market val value, 
um, of the productive resources that the person is selling to the market, right? The market value of what they produce and how productive they are. And so there's a match between that productivity in a competitive labor market that's very different from the mismatch that's occurring in the less competitive market in the way that we are thinking about it um, in terms of this case. So exploitation might persist in this case if the workers have trouble finding other jobs or problems in the justice system that aren't um, resolved. Right. We typically think like if we ask the question, what is exploitation and what characteristics um, would make a relationship in a labor market um, be described as being an example of exploitation? We would think that exploitation means workers are generally paid less than their productive contributions and are prevented from seeking uh, better options. Right. That would occur when. There's only one business that's hiring the labor in an industry. So this description we were just talking about of a monopsony um, would be consistent um, with this. Or if there's only one business hiring labor in a geographic area, we might have this feature. Um, but it could also occur if we have businesses colluding in some kind of oligopsony type scenario where they're colluding to keep out competition or gain control over a labor force. Um, and maybe gain control over that labor force from government. And so this can persist um, only if the worker search costs are high, if migration is restricted, or there's high barriers to entry of new firms, right? So when that feature of free entry and free exit is, is not operative, as we would see in a competitive labor market, then the exchanges would be artificially blocked in that type of So um, we want to think about some possible approaches um, to ethical issues. And I mentioned that there were three main ways of analyzing some of these ethical problems um, that we could think about. And we're going to divide these into thinking about outcomes, thinking about duty, and thinking about character. So we have three different out ethical approaches that are described in kind of the first column of this table. And the first one is an outcome-based ethics approach. Um, and you could kind of sum it up by the idea that outcomes matter. And the second one is a duty-based ethics approach that you could summarize as duty matters. And the third is a virtue-based ethics approach that you could summarize as character matters. And so if we wanted to determine whether or not sweatshops are helpful or, harm or harmful, by using these three approaches, right, we could certainly do so, and that's in the middle column here. So for this outcomes approach, we would, if we were going to um, uh, employ it, we would examine the outcomes in people's lives, and we would be considering the impact on workers' standard of living and the opportunity costs. So we would be thinking about the outcomes that occur and the benefits and costs associated with those outcomes. Right in, in terms of determining um, whether um, what is ethical in that that situation, right? Determining what we should do from a normative economic perspective, and decide how to guide our policy making. We may look at the benefits and costs and the impacts on, for example, standard of living, and then on the cost side, what's happening in terms of opportunity, costs, the value associated with different foregone opportunities. In the second ethical approach, if we think about this duty matters idea or duty-based ethics, we could be asking whether the basic dignity of all human beings is being upheld, um, if the process, particularly whether anyone's human rights are being violated, right? That would be a key question, right? Um, if they are being violated, we would say something is not ethical under this approach, right? Um, and we could consider, for example, um, some different um, pieces of legislation or international agreements that maybe are suggestive of kind of what the population agrees on in terms of what is basic dignity for human beings. 
So in the U.S., for example, we might look towards the Declaration of Independence as a basic idea of what government should be doing, should be doing, normative um, here, and how that would relate to basic dignity of human beings. Or maybe we want to look at something in an international scope like the Geneva Convention um, for the treatment of prisoners of war, right, to think about um, at an extreme what it means to be violating somebody's basic human rights. Right, so that's the second approach to ethical problems is to tie it to this idea of human rights. The third approach that we wanna consider here is this virtue-based ethics approach, that character matters. And so if we were gonna determine if sweatshops were helpful or harmful under this type of approach, we would wanna decide whether the sweatshops are contributing to the formation of good character and virtues for workers, for managers, for consumers, um, and maybe we're going to think about um, something about the superior person understands what is moral, the small person understands what is profitable, right? And maybe we would use that as a guidance to link um, our ethical um, idea to um, character and to virtues, right? So these are different approaches that may result in some different decision making by a population in terms of what is ethics and what is equity um, relative to this idea of like economic efficiency that we were thinking about in markets more broadly um, earlier on. Right, so here are some questions um, that we take might take a moment to think about in terms of perspectives, right? Sweatshops make it possible for wealthy consumers in developed countries to buy cheap products. Does this beneficial outcome make sweatshops morally justifiable? Why? Right, and you could link this to some of the moral perspectives for which you're arguing. Um, second, if Americans refuse to buy products made in countries that have sweatshops, who would benefit, who would hurt, be hurt, and why? And three, what, um, can people in developed countries do to improve working conditions in developing um, countries? So I want you to take a couple of minutes, right, as a class to think through um, some of this. Um, and if I see properly into the classroom here, it looks like there's maybe three or four rows of students um, that are in the class classroom. So I think I, I wanna ask, um, the first row and the very back row to think about the first question, the second row to think about the second question, and the third row to think about the third question, just with people who are sitting next to you. Um, I wanna give you about five minutes to just discuss with people next to you and think through um, your perspectives because you, you probably all have some very different perspectives in the room. Um, and I'm hoping that you can use this opportunity to really um, interact with each other, get to know each other better, um, and also interact with this material. So I'm going to give you guys about five minutes to talk to people who are next to you. Um, and I'm going to turn my microphone off and, and uh, I'll be back in about five minutes to continue on. All right, so I think you guys have had some time to um, talk with each other a little bit about your perspectives, and hopefully you were also able to link your perspectives to um, some of the approaches to ethical um, issues that we had noted. Um, so in terms of these ethical issues, we started with um, the outcomes approach and a lot of economists use the outcomes approach method of analysis <coughs> but being a good economist means examining not only what's visible in in terms of sweatshops but also what might be invisible extreme poverty for example in rural areas a worker, um, a rural worker probably won't have other job opportunities. So working in a, 
a sweatshop might be his or her best um, way to improve a standard of living. Um, at least that would be what the economist approach, this outcomes approach would be um, indicating. Um, the other approaches that we're thinking about kind of enrich our understanding by drawing attention to what society um, determines is civilized and just. And, and that was why we were looking at, for example, the U.S. Declaration of Independence, right, asserting that human beings are endowed with unalienable rights. Um, we have moral duties to other human beings regard it, regardless of the consequences, right? That's the idea there. And then the third one, the virtue-based ethics, was thinking about, you know, more about how Parents, um, you know, want their children to develop a good character trait, right? And we might think about um, different religions teaching virtuous conduct um, or what we might take from certain philosophers about um, character and emphasizing character. And so we want to think about whether sweatshops deprive workers of opportunities to develop excellence in their characters um from that um right and the success of family like moving to a location could be an example of one. so i would love to hear um maybe from a couple of representatives of um the groups that were speaking um what they thought right of this first question um that's really linking um, what we think about across countries and the products here. Do we have the technology to, to um, turn a microphone to a couple of student representatives? If so, can I get one representative, maybe from the first row, one from the second, one from the third, and one from the fourth? If I see a hand being raised in the first row. Thank you. Uh, hello. Good morning. Hello. For the first question, it's about whether it's morally justifiable. I have like two ideas, uh, two approaches for this, the outcome-based ethics, and then second is the duty-based ethics. For the outcome-based ethics, um, sweatshops are morally justifiable for me, at least, because um, it provides livelihood for people, despite it being um, tied to low wages, uh, long work hours, safety hazards prone to abuse, and other negative characteristics. The idea behind this is that it is better than having nothing, uh, no job, no money, no food to bring to the table, so at least they have that for their families. However, on the other hand, when it comes to the duty-based ethics, it is not morally justifiable because these workers aren't protected. Um, they don't have safety net, as we have also discussed prior. Uh, one example of this is um, Bangladesh. Bangladesh is known to being a cheap labor, uh, cheap uh, produce, uh, providing cheap production to um, famous um, clothing brands in Germany. Um, as I have written, as I have read in an article, the International Trade Union Confederation or ITUK published a report stating that interviews with workers in Bangladesh in 2021 show that the systematic violations of rights exposing um, the things that we have discussed, like the unfair labor practices, anti-union discrimination, unsafe workplaces, violence against workers, and other negative things. And to add to this problem, they don't have like a safe complaint mechanism to raise their problems and calling for grievances to be resolved. So um, the good thing about this is that there are international groups like the International Trade Union Confederation to raise these problems for, for everyone around the globe to be um, aware of these. However, their hands are kind of tied because it is the government of that country, in that case, Bangladesh, who has like the more power to, to solve these ethical issues. Thank you for detailed um, response. I agree with many of the things you said, and I think that um, 
you've linked very well to the idea of institutions. Um, so for example, what you mentioned in terms of a safe complaint mechanism, um, that does not exist everywhere. And so um, that could definitely be a way to split the difference between having livelihoods um, and um, and having cheap production, but also making sure that um, people are taken care of in some different ways. So I think that was a very excellent um, way to get our discussion started. What about a representative from the second question, right? Um, who would benefit? Who would be, be hurt if um, we changed up um, who's buying from these groups? can't see the classroom very well. And so if, if there's someone who is just volunteering, that person with the microphone, just select one representative to give a short response. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, so I think if Americans refuse to buy products made in countries that have sweatshops, who would benefit? First, of course, the countries that are sweatshops free, or in these terms, the workers that live in a country where they um, implement or prioritize ethical workplace and safety for workers. And then second, um, it also benefits the um, workers and the laborers who are working in the companies or the countries that are sweatshop free. And then lastly, it is the, um, the labor rights organizations because they are gaining supports and awareness in terms of the importance of ethical workplace. And then um, who would be hurt? I think first, um, it's actually just the opposite of my previous answers. The workers in the sh uh, sweatshop countries will be even more um, hurt than, um, before because um, if they are already being forced to work in a non-ethical way, now they are even um, in a hurtful place because um, the Americans are refusing to buy from the countries they're in. And then second, I think it also includes the workers in, or the firms in that country, whether um, they are implementing ethical workforce, but if the country itself are um, if the country have other sweatshops and then Americans are refusing to buy from them, and then that means the other workplace that are actually implementing ethical workplace also will get the um, the um, the hurts or like the bad impacts. And then lastly, the um, economies of sweatshops countries in general will be hurt. So I think that's my answers. Thank you so much. Thank you for that response. Um, I think you got most of the major players there in that dis description. I think it's definitely um, true that, you know, that that um, there could be some change in surplus, economic surplus going to different groups. Um, so, for example, um, if the production of products is moved to the United States as a result of something like this, um, we might see different factories in that in the U.S. Um, benefiting, right? The owners of those factories, but we also would see workers, as you mentioned, in developing countries hurt, right? Because um, they would be unemployed um, or implied, or maybe employed under worse conditions um, as well. And so there's um, there could be a lower standard of living. Um, there. So one group that I'm not sure that you mentioned that um, I think is worth mentioning as well, and I apologize if you did mention, but um, thinking about consumers as a group in this type of a question might be relevant as well. So for example, um, American consumers might be hurt by such an action um, because they'd be high, paying higher prices. Right. If if there was a, a change in distribution and this went to a new equilibrium price as a result. Um, and so there's a lot of different general equilibrium effects that could happen with um, such uh, refusal to buy products. Um, all right. Let's turn to the third one. So maybe there's a representative from the third row who could talk about um, people in developed countries, um, improving working conditions. Um, in developing countries, what are some actions we can think about? We've had two um, responses from ladies in the class. Is there a gentleman in the uh, third row willing to answer? 
Yes. Uh, hi, Anita. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, no, I think they say that the uh, the first step into solving a problem is to recognize there is one, right? So I believe um, mm -hmm. um, awareness probably is the first step, or the first stepping stone into it. Um, and I think we're also in a time where a corporate social responsibility and stuff are in limelight. Uh, so uh, when more people know about this stuff, they choose to avoid maybe buying from brands stuff that support sweatshops. And, uh, and eventually also maybe legislative proposals and um, regulations and guidelines can come from that as well when more, uh, more awareness is raised as well. Yes, I agree with that. So awareness maybe could lead to some different actions, right? And maybe something regulatory in terms of monitoring, maybe something in terms of aid or environment, as you mentioned. Um, absolutely. Thank you for participating in this. Um, all right, so I think I'm going to continue on um, and add some things to this um, and think again about um, some of the things that we might do, right, as uh, working towards a solution. So um, suppose that we have consumers who would like to buy products um, that are made under acceptable working conditions, right? So maybe as a result of some of these perspectives, um, as people learned more and had more awareness, maybe we have consumers who want to buy products made under more acceptable working conditions. One way would be to provide more information. And so we could have independent associations that are certifying factories to meet basic standards. Um, so, for example, Fair Labor Association ensures members abide by a workplace code of conduct. Um, prohibiting forced labor, child labor, harassment, discrimination, and unsafe working conditions. So we could have some kind of certification process in a variety of industries um, that could dissuade the use um, of sweatshops. Um, and so that's interrelated with um, some of the ideas of what to do about sweatshops. And I mentioned at the beginning that we would mention three possibilities. There are other possibilities out there as well, and some of which you, you guys have alluded to um, a little bit as well. But um, some that we might put forth would be to think about some kind of international treaty um, secondly, think about some kind of markets and monitoring. Or third, um, there's always a policy option to do nothing, right? Um, sometimes we don't think of that as a formal policy statement, but certainly doing nothing has its own economic benefits and consequences. And so in a lot of circumstances, we might want to think of that as a policy itself. And in the techniques of cost-benefit analysis, it's often the case that um, researchers think of no action um, as an action as well. So any attempt to reform um, sweatshops through government regulation would um, run into Gresham's law. Weak regulators will drive out strict regulators. And if capital is immobile, attempts to regulate sweatshops will likely drive capital to areas with less regulation. And in the first lecture, we talked about factors of production, sometimes being mobile and sometimes able to be changed and sometimes not being able to be changed and being fixed. And so this distinction might actually pertain to what we're thinking about the short run versus the long run um, as, as well from an economics perspective. Right, but let's think about um, each of these options in a little bit more detail, what this could look like. So an international treaty, right? If we had a similar treaty, um, similar to the Geneva Convention, established a minimum working conditions in a labor market, what basic rights should the treaty provide for every worker around the world, right? If we could come to an agreement as to what that might look like, Right? We would be making a normative policy statement, but we could impose ethics, um, some kind of ethical solution to that on our economic problem um, and frame our policy making. Or what are the difficulties of requiring firms to pay all workers around the world a living wage? Right, We would have several things that we would need to navigate in terms of difficulties to answer um, to be able to invoke something as an international treaty. 
treaty. Um, in the U.S., the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 set out basic working conditions um, that included restricting child labor and requiring companies to pay employees a minimum wage and overtime work if they worked more than 40 hours a week. You could imagine a case where we had something like that that was extended um, as a standard to um, multiple countries. And this is not to say that the Fair um, Labor Standards Act of 38 um, in the US perspective is working so well that it should definitely be a model for the world, right? And in fact, um, this is a particular one that if you look at what happens in agricultural labor markets, again, you would actually see that there are several places where there could be, um, where we could see breakdowns where this is not being um, enforced and restricted um, in, in terms of some of the things we see. But maybe the ideas of the act, right, and the basic principles could be something that could be a working framework. And we um, would definitely have to think through all the advantages and disadvantages um, of using treaties to establish um, worker rights um, if we were to use um, such a thing, right? From an advantage perspective, we could think about trying to level the playing field for factories in all kinds of countries. Um, from a disadvantage perspective, we could think about countries with worse labor conditions um, being in a position where they can't be forced to sign into um, a treaty like this. Um, Unless there's some kind of mechanism of enforcement, a treaty would lack, would really lack effective teeth um, to make a difference. And signing it would make a country maybe look look good, but, but would produce little change um, in actuality. So regulations um, would impose costs on businesses. They would have to be enforced. Um, and when regulations are excessive, government regulators can be bribed, leading to greater um, corruption in society um, as well. So lots of things to think about from a cost and benefit perspective um, to answer a question um, like this. In terms of the second option, thinking about different types of markets and monitoring, we could again kind of think about a market monitoring approach and what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages to think about um, the sol different solution. From an advantage perspective, we might think about how businesses listen um, to consumers. If uh, people insist on improved labor conditions before they buy a product, then companies would quickly adapt. Um, and if this approach is non-coercive, um, relying instead on businesses' own, um, it would rely instead on businesses' own profit um, motive for its implementation. Um, for disadvantages, in order for consumers to re react to sweatshops, um, and sweatshop conditions. There must be a free press or some kind of mechanism to report um, abuses. And so the discussion before um, the student who mentioned safe complaint mechanism, right, would fit into something like this, right? We would need some kind of framework. Um, if consumers are informed, they may not be um, interested in sweatshops, um, certification programs, cost apparel makers money, um, which would likely mean higher prices for consumers. Many companies use subcontractors to provide different types of textile products, for example, and there might be a lack of transparency in those relationships as well. And then different certifying organizations may have contradictory standards, for example, whether there should be a living wage, making it difficult for producers um, and consumers, and manufacturers may feel um, intimidated, maybe blackmailed by certifying organizations which have the ability to put them out of um, business. So we can definitely go through kind of a list of possible advantages and disadvantages of that approach as we could for the third case, right? For the idea of taking um, no action, we could um, do the same type of thought experiment in terms of this, right? So um, for this one, um, 
the take no action approach. An advantage is that an action might um, harm sweatshop workers. There's going to be winners and losers from any action or um, lack of action. Um, sometimes acts that are motivated by good intentions may not actually make things better. We can say that for a lot of things um, in the world, that um, different actions that were with good intentions actually made things worse. Um, when the United States was was poor, for example, it had many sweatshops. And so that, that brings up questions about economic growth and social legislation um, and how that problem could be fixed over time in other settings um, as well. Um, people should be alert of, of the dangers um, of moral relativism when they're evaluating opportunities for interventions um, in overseas affairs. And so um, we may want to be um, a little more cautious, right? That we're not being ethnocentric, for example. Um, on the disadvantage side, if our, our moral conscious um, is being um, deeply affected, doing nothing seems like um, a, a morally intolerable um, solution. Um, and so there might be a sense that people don't want to stand by and watch different types of human rights abuses. Um, and that could be, you know, a short-sighted um, um, feeling. Um, doing nothing may result in capitalism, developing a bad image, or it could result in much stricter governmental controls and intrusion later. And uh, people never will have perfect, um, perfect, perfect information. And so requiring um, perfect information before acting um, might just be a moment of making policy paralyzed, right? And so um, we could think about some uh, advantages and disadvantages of that type of approach. Certainly don't want to forget the approach of do nothing as a possibility as well. So um, the big picture in all of this, right, is that um, sweatshops exist because of economic, but also non-economic conditions. And if um, one of these sweatshops is profitable, the pursuit of profit could eventually lead to um, imitation and rivalry that could push up wages if the market is competitive. And so we definitely do want to make a distinction between a competitive and a non-competitive market when thinking about um, what could be happening and what should we be doing from an economic perspective. Um, when there's a large inflow, for example, of unskilled workers from rural areas, the process could take um, decades. And so um, in some cases, there might be parameters where kind of a do nothing, wait it out approach um, might seem to make sense. But in other approaches, um, time might be more of the essence um, in terms of pushing up wages to a higher level, right? This long run may be very long run in terms of getting all of those factors of production to be perfectly variable um, for this, right? So um, pursuing different ethical approaches can improve some factory conditions, but not others. It might create some complications. It might create things like higher unemployment. Um, and a problem that we come back to is that in some places in the world, there's um, a lack of a justice system that's um, perhaps working in a way that we might feel is um, equitable. Right. So um, lots of um, things contained within that um, summary um, as well, right? Um, just thinking about um, economic and moral problems as usually being much more complex than they first appear. And so some of the simplistic solutions that we might come up with might have their own set of problems. So it's a word of caution um, as well. And if we wanted to answer these questions from the perspective of an economist, um, we really want to see what is hidden as well as what is um, visible. And so thinking about all of those costs and benefits um, and using different approaches, for example, using an outcomes-based approach and then building off of it using some of the other approaches 
might be a way to create um, and improve um, some of the situations here. Right, so there might be a call here, um, a solution of bringing our approaches together in terms of thinking about this. All right, so um, uh, we have a couple more discussion questions that I am gonna ask the group to please um, take a couple of minutes to think about with people around you. Um, let's say maybe uh, first row and the third row could think about do sweatshops prove that firms exploit workers in developing countries. And uh, the second and the fourth row could think about these advantages and disadvantages that we just thought about across the, the policy options and make a case for one of the solutions, right? And to refresh your memory for the policy option, having an international treaty, um, having markets with monitoring or taking no action were the three that we had a look at. Right, so would the fir first and third group think about um, the exploitation aspect one more time? And the second and fourth, if you could think about making a case for one of the three policy options in light of the, adva the advantages and disadvantages which we just mentioned. Um, and then I'm gonna ask for our volunteers, hopefully some different volunteers from the ones who um, graciously volunteered in the first group to um, answer these questions. So I'm gonna give you guys about five minutes again and then we'll close this out. All right, so we have about 10 minutes left in the hour. Um, and so I am hopeful um, that there might be um, a couple of representatives interested in um, analyzing these questions for us, giving us some um, feedback from your discussions. Um, so I'm wondering if somebody is willing to um, take a stab at this first question. Do sweatshops prove that firms um, exploit workers in developing countries and why? Is there a volunteer that would be willing to speak to that? Um, hello, my name is Nadia, Nadia Felianasari. Uh, does the sweet shop prove that companies exploit workers in developing countries? Why? Uh, in my opinion, in developing countries, especially in areas that don't really focus on human development and education, it's true that the switch of exploit them because with the lack of the quality of human resources that cause circumstances to force them to work for low pay. This is also evidenced by the long hours of work around 12 hours or of work or even more. Sadly, in developing countries, many of these workers think that the salary they get is high enough, but in my opinion, the salary is not balanced with the energy and time they sacrifice. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to add to that perspective or provide a, a contrasting perspective? Yes, hello. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you. In our discussion, we talked a lot about like the transition of China going from like a developing country into a developed country. And in that process, you see a lot of huge corporations changing their production uh, sites from China to other developing countries. And we believe it shows like a clear example of uh, developing countries exploiting no, sorry, developed countries exploiting developing countries because if they weren't, they would just have kept their production within China even as the labor increases in price. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So to play devil advocate, um, what if I were to say um, that if we had a competitive market and we had low wages, um, we might have a, and we had a situation where labor supply was very large relative um, to uh, labor demands, um, that we might end up with 
um, productive, underpaid workers who move on and therefore are not um, exploited in the labor market. Um, would anyone like to respond to that idea? Thank you. Hello. My name is William. Hi, I'm from uh, Copenhagen Business School. Um, yes. So we talked about that uh, about that um, switch shops is a result of profit maximization. So mm -hmm. in the end, um, the companies would just like still uh, find the the lowest. Um, like find workers that are paid the lowest just to maximize their own profits because they want mm -hmm. to keep the price low for the consumers. So mm -hmm. even though that the workers would just uh, move on to, to another location to, to get higher pay, um, the, 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 the workers would still be exploited in, mm -hmm. like in, in new um, sweatshops would, that would pop up, pop up uh, because of the, the demand mm -hmm. for the consumers. Of the consumers. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm not disagreeing with you guys. I, I actually um, lean in the same direction, which seems to be the consensus um, in the classroom from those who have, who have spoken at least about the exploitation um, features. Um, I'm I'm just trying to also. Um, illustrate that there's a couple of different cases that relate to the economic perspective that we talked about in terms of either starting from a position with competition um, dynamics or starting from a position with less competition dynamics. And if we're starting from a position with less competition dynamics, that idea about workers just moving on and going to places where they're not going to be exploited in the long run um, that's where that starts breaking down. And I think that's the case that a lot of you are mentioning um, in terms of some of the examples that you've provided, that there are cases in the world where workers face high search costs um, and that there are different um, pressures that are, are meaning that new firms can't enter. Um, and so those kind of assumptions of perfect competition that we kind of start with and say that workers um, should be able to move on are really breaking down in a lot of those um, circumstances. Um, another thing that I will kind of leave you with as well that kind of is another devil's advocate type of a, um, a statement or, or analysis to put forth is that um, there are a lot of arguments, not just in terms of sweatshops, but in terms of setting minimum wages for workers. And something that comes out in a lot of those discussions is that a living wage theoretically could potentially look like a price floor that ultimately leads to a surplus of labor, right? So if we trace through our supply and demand diagrams and we say that we put this kind of artificial price floor in there with this higher wage, that could lead to a surplus of labor and as a result, workers could end up losing jobs. Um, and um, in that case, the living wage maybe is not doing what it's um, intended to do in that type of case. And so some researchers and some policymakers might talk about fixing other institutions like improving education or transportation or communication um, so that workers have less barriers to find better jobs. And we have something that approximates um, competition better. Um, but some of those arguments about setting the minimum prices, the price floors, um, these living wages, and workers necessarily losing jobs, they're based on that, that perfect competition market assumption that we kind of started with, right? And so um, if we're assuming everything is working, you know, correctly according to these these complex models that we're thinking about, sometimes we could come to that conclusion. But in the real world, sometimes our approximations are not good enough. And I think that a lot of the things you guys are, are jumping in on are um, related to that not good enough point. And I think that's an excellent place to be discussing in this, this class. Maybe we can take one person for number two. Um, 
which of the solutions did we end up favoring in, in some of our groups? Is there a volunteer who would like to speak to it? There are three options. We had do nothing, right? We had do, um, thinking about um, markets and monitoring. So doing something in terms of monitoring. Um, and we thought about having an international treaty. There were a couple of groups that were thinking about that one more and developing a case from one of those versus the other others based on our perspectives here. I think I saw a hand going up. Thank you. Appreciate you. There are like faults with all of them. None of them are perfect, but I believe that the monitoring one would be the most beneficial because an international treaty would be very difficult to establish because we have so so many differences between all of the countries. Um, yep. And you could see like maybe a lot of com uh, countries would benefit from an international treaty, but you would also see a lot of uh, countries who would really have a disadvantage because they were not able to compete uh, with the uh, other countries within an international treaty. Therefore, mm -hmm. monitoring would it, it it wouldn't be a, you won't you won't be able to monitor everything, but at least in some way factories and and other establishment would know that the possibility of being monitored is there and would therefore most likely become uh, better than they are at the the point now. Yeah. So creating some kind of slow pressure, right, as a starting point, I think. Uh, is a great solution or a great starting point towards a solution. Um, so we are at the end of this section. I want to say that I really appreciate everyone for your attention in both of these. I know it's difficult to have somebody um, present online as opposed to in person. It would be much better, better for all of us if we are in the room together, but I really appreciate all of your efforts to um, take a look at this material. Um, at the end here, I have a few resources listed of things um, where you could learn a little bit more. So I have some of the papers um, listed that I discussed in terms of the agricultural labor um, example. Um, I, I have um, a, a paper listed here as well um, that comes from the jur Journal of um, Business Ethics. So something went wrong in the word ethics there <laughs> in the um, citation, but about the ethical and economic case of sweatshirt shop labor. And then on ethics applied to economics in general, the Journal of Economic Perspectives tends to have some really great summary articles that um, take things from a big picture perspective. And so I especially encourage um, those of you who are interested in the topics of ethics and economics together to take a look at that last study. Um, I think it's a really great summary um, that has some things to add here. So with that, I want to thank everyone again for your attention and your patience with this process of doing this remotely. My understanding from taking a look at your schedule is that you're going to break and go on some tours or some other activities on campus. And I hope that you enjoy um, all those activities. Um, and while you're at it, um, if you have a chance to look at any of the university, you know, bookstore or anything like that, you might take a look at if um, the t-shirts or, or sweatshirts look like maybe they um, came from a sweatshop, right? And I, I, won't, I don't want to single out any university, um, but I encourage you to do that at home as well, right? At your home universities, um, take a look. Um, there are some university shops that adhere to different um, certifying codes for um, university sweatshirt shirts, and that's um, usually discussed in some of the school policy documents. So that might be something interesting as an interesting extension um, to take a look at um, and to think about as you're um, existing as a consumer. So thank you all again um, for your attention. I really appreciated um, the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Yeah.